John Brennan, uh, your reaction to this to this dilemma, I want to get into the specifics of the intelligence reports. But but before we do, uh, is, is there something do you see something? Do you recognize something in the propaganda style of the Trump White House uh, with other regimes you've studied over the years around the world where they want to get attention away? Uh, they want to get the people's attention away from the most damaging possible story about that regime. Uh, and so they try to create other such stories. Well, good evening, Lawrence. And you're absolutely right. I have seen, observed this type of behavior uh, in authoritarian leaders around the world for many, many years. Uh, this is you know, taken right out of the authoritarian's playbook, which is that you try to create a distraction from the challenges and problems that you face on the domestic front. And sometimes you point to other domestic issues or you point to external enemies. And I think Donald Trump has had a history now over the last three and a half years of being unfortunately masterful as far as trying to distract attention from the issues and the problems, many of which that he has created or made worse. And so I think as Jelani said, we have a track record right now that has demonstrated that uh, Donald Trump not only is unable to address these issues, but just focuses on what he can do, what other new shiny object he can throw in front of his base and the American public as a way to distract from those issues that really are challenging our, our safety, our security, and these days our health. Uh, and let me uh, let me go into some of the details that The New York Times has revealed about uh, where this story stands as of now. The administration uh, produced a memo, hasn't been made public, but The New York Times is reporting on that intelligence memo. And, and uh, I want to get uh, your reaction to it, uh, John Brennan. So The New York Times is reporting that a memo produced in recent days by the Office of the Nation's top intelligence official acknowledged that the CIA and top counterterrorism officials have assessed that Russia appears to have offered bounties to kill American and coalition troops in Afghanistan, but emphasized uncertainties and gaps in evidence, according to three officials. The memo said that the CIA and the National Counterterrorism Center had assessed with medium confidence, meaning credibly sourced and plausible, but falling short of near certainty that a unit of the Russian military intelligence service known as the GRU offered the bounties, according to two of the officials briefed on its contents. Uh, John Brennan, what is your reading of what, what, what can you glean from the public reports about this intelligence so far? Well, first of all, I wonder why this memo was only written now in response to press reports, as opposed to being written several months ago when these reports first came in, so that they could be provided to the White House and to senior officials. But it seems as though this memo was cobbled together uh, by the Office of Director of National Intelligence as a way to address the issue and also highlighting that there is some dissent within the community about the credibility of the reporting. But let me tell you, based on my 30 years of experience in working in the intelligence community and national security, the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Counterterrorism Center are the premier all-source analytic elements of the U.S. government that have the greatest capability and expertise to evaluate something like this. And if they say that they have assessed with medium confidence, that is a pretty strong endorsement that this intelligence appears to be very credible. And that's why it's incumbent upon the White House, the National Security Council, the National Security Advisor to do everything possible to mitigate the threat to our troops. But I think, again, it's clear that, you know, it's in some respects strange that we're still debating the question about whether or not Donald Trump would do anything that a normal president or even a normal person would do in these instances. He does not take his job and responsibility seriously. And unfortunately, it is putting the lives of American women and men who serve in uniform and the country's service uh, at great risk. Is there something, do you see something, do you recognize something in the propaganda style of the Trump White House uh, with other regimes you've studied over the years around the world where they want to get attention away, uh, they want to get the people's attention away from the most damaging possible story about that regime, uh, and so they try to create other such stories? Well, good evening, Lawrence. And you're absolutely right. I have seen, observed this type of behavior uh, in authoritarian leaders around the world for many, many years. Uh, this is you know, taken right out of the authoritarian's playbook, which is that you try to create a distraction from the challenges and problems that you face on the domestic front. 
And sometimes you point to other domestic issues or you point to external enemies. And I think Donald Trump has had a history now over the last three and a half years of being, unfortunately, masterful as far as trying to distract attention from the issues and the problems, many of which that he has created or made worse. And so I think, as Jelani said, we have a track record right now that has demonstrated that uh, Donald Trump not only is unable to address these issues, but just focuses on what he can do, what other new shiny object he can throw in front of his base and the American public as a way to distract from those issues that really are challenging our, our safety, our security, and these days our health. Uh, and let me uh, let me go into some of the details that The New York Times has revealed about uh, where this story stands as of now. The administration uh, produced a memo, hasn't been made public, but The New York Times is reporting on that intelligence memo. And, and uh, I want to get uh, your reaction to it, uh, John Brennan. So The New York Times is reporting that a memo produced in recent days by the Office of the Nation's top intelligence official acknowledged that the CIA and top counterterrorism officials have assessed that Russia appears to have offered bounties to kill American and coalition troops in Afghanistan, but emphasized uncertainties and gaps in evidence, according to three officials. The memo said that the CIA and the National Counterterrorism Center had assessed with medium confidence, meaning credibly sourced and plausible, but falling short of near certainty that a unit of the Russian military intelligence service known as the GRU offered the bounties, according to two of the officials briefed on its contents. Uh, John Brennan, what is your reading of what, what, what can you glean from the public reports about this intelligence so far? Well, first of all, I wonder why this memo was only written now in response to press reports, as opposed to being written several months ago when these reports first came in, so that they could be provided to the White House and to senior officials. But it seems as though this memo was cobbled together uh, by the Office of Director of National Intelligence as a way to address the issue, and also highlighting that there is some dissent within the community about the credibility of the reporting. But let me tell you, based on my 30 years of experience in working in the intelligence community and national security, the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Counterterrorism Center are the premier all-source analytic elements of the U.S. government that have the greatest capability and expertise to evaluate something like this. And if they say that they have assessed with medium confidence, that is a pretty strong endorsement that this intelligence appears to be very credible. And that's why it's incumbent upon the White House, the National Security Council, the National Security Advisor to do everything possible to mitigate the threat to our troops. But I think, again, it's clear that, you know, it's in some respects strange that we're still debating the question about whether or not Donald Trump would do anything that a normal president or even a normal person would do in these instances. He does not take his job and responsibility seriously. And unfortunately, it is putting the lives of American women and men who serve in uniform in the country's service uh, at great risk. The New York Times had to sue the Centers for Disease Control under the Freedom of Information Act to obtain data on the demogra demographic impact of the coronavirus, which allowed the Times then to publish its lead story on page one today. Having studied the data, the New York Times reports Latino and African-American residents of the United States have been three times as likely to become infected as their white neighbors. Black and Latino people have been nearly twice as likely to die from the virus as white people. Of Latino people who died, more than a quarter were younger than 60. Among white people who died, only 6% were that young. Experts point to circumstances that have made black and Latino people more likely than white people to be exposed to the virus. Many of them have frontline jobs that keep them from working at home, rely on public transportation, or live in cramped apartments or multi-generational homes. Joining our discussion now is Julian Castro, the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Obama administration. He is a former mayor of San Antonio, Texas. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I want to get your reaction to this reporting in The New York Times today. Well, it's a blockbuster report, uh, eye-opening, I think, for a lot of people. It's, what can you say? It's appalling. It's tragic. Uh, it's infuriating. 
It's also, Lawrence, you know, for folks who are still wondering why so many people are out there on the streets or have been out there over the last six weeks protesting inequality in this country, this is a perfect example of what people are talking about. We know that this is the result of so much inequality, systemic racism and inequality in house life and death in these communities. Uh, on top of that, as you showed there, one of the biggest ironies here is that the community that have suffered the most have also been asked to do the most. They have been the ones going and working in the fields as farm workers, working in these meat packing plants that have outbreaks of coronavirus. Uh, they're fast food workers who are working for low wages and bad benefits, grocery store workers. Uh, and so all around, it is a prime example uh, of the inequities that continue to haunt this nation. And the important question now is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Not just the, the public health aspect, but beyond this time period, you know, the next few weeks, what are we going to do about this? I, I want to go to some of the facts that the Times uh, uncovered to to specify just how difficult this is in these communities, uh, especially the, the the difficulty in working at home, which is next to impossible. It says across the country, 43 percent of black and Latino workers are employed in service or production jobs that for the most part cannot be done remotely. Census data from 2018 shows only about one in four white workers held such jobs. And so uh, there, there are the numbers right there on, on the safest thing you can do, which is stay at home. That's just not available uh, to, the, to at least half of these workers. That's right. I mean, that that is a stunning statistic, but it relates to the plight of so many families out there, disproportionately uh, black and Latino, that don't have the option. They don't have the option of, of staying home. They need to go to work if they're going to get a paycheck. They work in these industries that actually require them to be on site. Uh, and uh, that's why I think that uh, we need to do things like pass the HEROES Act, uh, offer direct rental assistance to people so that they can hold on to their housing. Uh, we need to do more in a, in a robust way to provide a stronger safety net during this coronavirus time period and going forward. Uh, it's also, I think, a great demonstration of why we need universal health care. We need to ensure that uh, we close that digital divide. We need to ensure that we raise the minimum wage and provide good benefits for people. What is your reaction uh, to the federal judge's ruling that you've been fighting for for so many years? Well, you know, I think it's a, a step in the right direction. It's something that um, we've been always putting in front of the judge, uh, this argument that this pipeline isn't safe and uh, our, our people have a right and we should be heard. Uh, the pipeline, uh, when it was granted, violated federal law. Uh, we always knew that, and we, we, we're just thankful that the judge is starting to, to see uh, what we've been saying all along for the past four years. Um, it feels good. Today's a good day. And I know it's not uh, over. I know that the EIS process still has to take place, um, but it's, in a step in the, it's a step in the right direction where, where we get to uh, hopefully be a part of the EIS process, the environmental impact statement process, uh, our tribe should be included in every step. Uh, our technical team and our experts should be uh, presenting our concern, concerns all along the way. Uh, that's what's needed in the future. Uh, but for now, uh, it is a good day uh, to, to finally know that uh, there, there, there is a real threat to our, our humanity. Uh, a real threat to our environment. And uh, right now with the judge's ruling, with the, the flow of the pipeline stopping um, and being empty, uh, that threat will be gone temporarily. Uh, but we have to be included in the process to, to continue and express our concerns. The, uh, the judge's order requires them to go through the full environmental impact studies that they failed to do before. It leaves open the possibility, the, the, the judge is finding, that at the end of all of that, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers could issue an approval. But Joe Biden, if that, that would 
if that does run its course, if that is legally allowed to run its course, it is very likely that it would be uh, next year after we may have a new president. And Joe Biden has said uh, that he would support the tribe on this and he would not allow uh, this pipeline uh, to reopen there. So it, this is one of those cases that in the end may be decided by the presidential election, as it was last time. Yeah, and that's and that's uh, the one of the main reasons why it's so important that indigenous peoples or are, are peoples of this country get out and vote uh, and and express uh, their concerns and and why uh, we need to have a voice. Uh, so it's it's very important that we're a part of this uh, process. And uh, explain to our audience the the root of this pipeline, which is when you when you're out there and you see it, it's it's so extraordinary. It, it makes you know it makes a certain visual sense when you see it crossing the land, but it actually goes under the lake. This this very large lake that your tribe has always uh, lived with as both a a sacred place and a very necessary place to daily life. That it's it's the pipeline under the lake that the judge was especially worried about. Yeah, it's a it's a project uh, with this magnitude, this size of a project. Uh, it it doesn't warrant just an environmental assessment, uh, especially if there's a, a population that has concern. And we've always had a concern, but it seemed like we never were heard. So uh, when our youth stood up and start speaking out, saying that you know we we have to think about the future of our nation. Uh, the leadership step forward, and, and uh, I commend the leadership today for continuing this fight uh, to to make sure that uh, a project of this size and a threat to our nation, uh, not just the Standing Rock Nation, but to the United States, uh, goes through the, the proper legal processes and reviews. Uh, and that was our, our argument from the very beginning.